it's us. It's unboxing a clock. Welcome to your unboxing video. I am your girl, Adri. We have yet another box. The theme is Trip to the Tropics. So we called in the big wigs and we are gonna get really, really serious about this. So get your box, get it all open. Let's talk about what's in it and let's talk about how you should use it. To get started, we have two different items from our bar and bitters area. You've got BG Reynolds Orjat and Bitters Labs Aromatic Bitters. These are two items that we want you to have for your summer cocktailing. We have a pro to show you how to do that, but if you're not gonna cocktail, you can throw this Orjat into your coffee, into your pastry creams, into your cakes, into maybe something for your crepes. Get really fun and playful with it. You're going to get some fun floral almondy flavor, but don't just keep it at your bar. Maybe keep it in your pantry. See how it goes. On top of that, we also have Bitters Labs Aromatic. Andrea got her start as a cake decorator and baker. She wanted to work with extractions that were really potent, really flavorful, and really aromatic, and she was pretty disappointed with all the things that were available in the market. So she tried her hand at making her own, and hot damn, she was really good at it. So what you have is kind of an updated play on the classic aromatics you would get in Angostura bitters. However, it's a bit more sweet, a bit more floral. Not sweet in the sense of sugar added. There is no sugar in this, but you get a bit more of that kind of fruitier side of what we're used to in classic aromatic bitters. So, uh, if you know me, you know I am not cocktail people. I love them, I can't make them. I'm very, very, very bad at it. So I'd like you to meet my friend, Mikey Edwards. Uh, Mikey has quite the history in making tropical cocktails and he is a master at it and a really great friend. Hey buddy, how you Hi. doing? Missed you. Trip to the tropics. Uh, what should, what would one do with these things? What are you gonna make that I could never? We're going to make the quintessential tiki cocktail. It's called the Mai Tai. A little background on the drink. Um, there are two pioneers of the tiki cocktail scene. You've got Don the Beachcomber and Trader Vic. This is the Trader Vic um, masterpiece. It's the simple, yet elegant drink. Uh, where Don Beach, he borrowed the Planner's Punch from Jamaica. Trader Vic went to Cuba. And most of his drinks were iterations of a daiquiri, which is that holy trinity of rum, lime, and sugar. The Mai Tai is not that different, it's not that far off from that. Um, let's, we'll start it, we'll start it with the first part of that trinity, which is the lime. Get nice, fresh limes, uh, go to your local farmer's market, get them if you can. I know they're expensive now, but it pays to have nice limes. Uh, I was always taught that your cocktail is only as good as the worst ingredient you put in it. So good limes, good ice, good syrups. If you put one thing bad, the whole thing diminishes. So let's get good limes. These are from our friends at Central Ninth. So these are some really nice limes. We love you, Central Ninth. Day Hi, best. guys. Day to best. Get a giant, really oversized knife. Um, the biggest one you can find, I think, is the best. Big knife energy. <laughs> okay. So if you look at the recipe, it calls for the juice of one lime. If you look at the 1944 Trader Vic uh, spec, spec uh, is the cocktail-like recipe, the original one, it calls for juice of one lime, which is shorthand between three quarters and one ounce of lime. So kind of what I like to do with this, I like to see what I get. This is a big juicy lime. So I think we might get an ounce from it. If that's the case, I'd be pretty happy. So get your jumbo jigger here. Oh my gosh, that's a lot of juice. That's already almost, that's one ounce from half the lime. That's incredible. I'm not gonna go any more than that. That's wonderful. Because usually you get these little dinky limes and you get like half an ounce from each of them. So that's one ounce of lime juice. We're dropping that in. Now we have our BG Reynolds Orjat. This is a fun ingredient. Um, I was introduced to this stuff kind of secondhand. I didn't know what it was. We didn't have access to it, so we had to make it our, ourselves when I first started bartending in a tiki bar. It's one of the most exciting things to make. You get the most amazing smells. You get the orange blossom water, the almonds. Right Today in the market, you have tons of different options. This is a great one. Um, use what you can, make your own, or get this one. We've sent this with the package, right? Mm -hmm. This is a lovely orange. It'll give a lot of flavor. It has it really heavy on the marzipan, so that kind of like almond croissant aspect. So we're going half an ounce of that. Where's my jumbo jigger? Boop. Dumping that right on here. Now, in. with stuff like this, would you maybe refrigerate it, or is it like sweet enough that you don't need to, or... Like, where does your orchard live in your life? 
With syrups in general, I keep them in the fridge. It's so, I mean, this little bottle, if you're making cocktails like me every night and morning, you're gonna wanna, <laughs> you can kind of leave it on the shelf, but I recommend refrigerating these. It'll just increase the shelf life. They, they last a long time with so much sugar, but yeah, I keep them, I keep them in the fridge. Safety first. Okay, so we got our ore drop, we got our lime. This is an ingredient that I was always skeptical of using. It's called rock candy syrup. It's pretty much thin, thick, simple syrup. So where you use, normally make simple syrup with one to one water to sugar, you can make this with the clump here like maybe three to one, so it's really thick. And when we started using this for our classes, it did something incredible with the drink and it made it a lot richer, it made the consistency better. Because especially when you're using the rum and the lime and the orgeat, the consistency of the texture can sometimes diminish. This stuff is really gonna hold the drink together. So I use about an eighth of an ounce, which is usually if you have a bar spoon you do that, but for all intents and purposes, you can just do a little blip. Like, don't blip too much, but blip just a little bit, a little blip. That's all it is. It's about an eighth of an ounce. Blip is a scientific term. And you have to say it if you yeah. do that. Yeah, blip, blip. Okay, so we got our accessories in. Now we're going to the fun stuff, the rum and the, and the, the curacao. This is the classic Mai Tai orange liqueur. You have uh, other ones on the market. You have Cointreau, you have Grand Marnier, you have like just generic triple sec. This is the one to go with, especially if you're using rum-based drink. This is from uh, the Dutch Caribbean. It's uh, Island of Curacao, bitter orange. Uh, it's got a lot of the flavors that accentuate the orange drop. Um, think like, think orange peel. Think, uh, uh, what's that? What's that stuff called? Oh, this stuff. I can't talk about that yet. But oh. It's got a lot of the stuff that we're talking about later. A lot of those flavors. <laughs> Sneaky sneak. So we're going half ounce of that. Bloop, bloop, bloop. So right now in our shaker tin, oops, wrong one. We got curacao, we got rock candy sugar, we got orange out, we got lime juice. In the recipe I provided, we talked a little bit about the original recipe being kind of inaccessible. The OG rum was the uh, Ray Nephew 17 year. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, for pretty much the past half, half, as long as we've had this recipe, people have been trying to emulate that. There's rums in the market that are like close to the original uh, Trader Vic Mai Tai rum blend. But what I like to do is kind of, and what bartenders have agreed upon, is using a young agricole and a funky Jamaican. Um, if you don't have access to a funky Jamaican, if you're using Appleton, you're gonna wanna cut it with something with a lot more of that funk, a lot of that hogo. Um, it's kind of a quintessential part of this drink. Um, so we're gonna start with the agricole. This is Nissan. this is like the, your, your king of young agricoles. It's gonna give you a lot of that flavor, that grassiness, that, that herbaceousness. Um, I think you get, you get this in Utah. You, sure you can. can get this at any old store in Utah. If you have access to other agricoles, try them. The, this drink's, the fun about this drink is trying different modulations, different specs. This is the kind of one we go with as a basic, but if you have different agricole, try it out. Also, fun fact, the old recipe called for uh, agricole before the AOC started to regulate it, so it was probably a molasses-based agricole. It's probably a lot richer than what we're used to in these uh, AOC-regulated agricoles. Just a fun thought. So, like, when you're making this drink and people are talking, like, the pure, the old recipe, it's not even available. Those rums aren't on the market, so play around. Have fun with it. Um, here we have the Jamaica. This is the plantation Jamaica. That's the name, I can't remember the, uh, is the Arap. There's a tribe on the island that was there before the settlers came. That's what they called the island. Um, if, you, if you're familiar with this rum plantation, they age their rum lightly in the Caribbean, then they ship it over to France where they age it. Uh, it's a really cool process. They're also dosing their rums like they do with cognac. So they add a little bit of sugar. They're straightforward with it. Where some rums, when they add sugar, they don't really tell you what they're adding. These guys are very straightforward. Uh, I love using them. So I'm gonna add, I'm gonna do a little Jamaican blend here. This one's nice, but it's not as funky as I want. So I'm gonna add a little bit of funk with another rum. That's a half ounce of that. Boop. So here we're gonna do, we're gonna have some fun here. This guy just came on the market. This is the Hamilton single barrel Jamaican. There's about 200 bottles of these in the world. We're gonna show the versatility of this drink. So this is a, very strong, 68% Jamaican rum, has a lot of funk, has a lot of ripe fruits. And we're gonna use this as our modifier to add some of that traditional Jamaican rum flavor. Boop. Now, this is my secret weapon. 
Is the foundation OFTD? 69%. I use this as a fortifier. When I'm wanting a little more body in a drink, I'll add a little, maybe eight to quarter ounce of this. In the recipe I sent you, it asked for about a quarter ounce. So we're gonna use that. Boop. Just for body. This is a mix of Guyana, Jamaica, Barbadian rum. Uh, some of the best rum blenders in the world came together to put this bottle up. Uh, if you're ever missing some, some of that like fruit flavor in your drinks, this guy's gonna really brighten it up, bolden it up. Okay. Our drink is built. Uh -oh, that's nice. Don't use your hands when you're making ice for friends, but since it's just for us, we're gonna use our hands. We're family. Yeah, we're friends. I have a big brother I never wanted. <laughs> but now I got him, so here we are. Mikey's hand, could you clean my drink? Not in yours. And that is okay with me. It's fine. It's I'm fine. fine. It's we're fine. nice. It's all good. Um, this drink all is supposed to be shaken. Again, this drink's so fun, try blending it. Do different stuff with it. The traditional recipe says shaken with ice. That's what we're gonna do. I've used these in the little Hamilton blenders. It comes out really nice. You can use different ice. I used, um, I don't use crushed ice, I use full ice because I like that kind of, the rattled quality you get when you use full ice. If you use crushed ice, it can be a little softer. Try it out, try different things. I'm gonna shake just enough for the dilution to occur. You get that nice little film, film of uh, frost on the glass. It should film up faster because it's got some overproof rums in it. The higher proof the rums, the quicker it frosts up. Alrighty. It's time for my favorite term. Mm hmm The dirty dump. It's real, we checked. This is a, I mean, you, in most cocktail bars you see them double straining, fine straining. In tiki bars, you're getting dirty dumps all the time on account of, one, you don't need to strain it because of the, 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 the drink, they're usually just served in, in rocks glasses over ice. You're not getting the, the beauty drink's not from the way it looks in the glass, it's from the garnish, from the color. So the quality of the ice and the way it looks, if it's broken up, doesn't matter too much. This is the traditional garnish. We're gonna add this guy and this guy. So, Trader Vic says you wanna make it look like a little tropical island with the palm tree. That's the lime that we used. And when you're using mint, if you have your own garden, that's the way to go. Oop. Don't let the island sink either. This is mint fresh from the garden. Grab a few sprigs, slap it around a bit. It's been a bad, bad boy. Slap it around and make it look like a little palm tree over your island. Ooh. Look at that little guy. That's cute. Now, we, we mentioned these bitters here. Um, we're using this as aromatic. So it has a lot of that traditional Ingo flavor, but it's also got this like cherry aspect to it. I think it accentuates the almond quite a bit. So we're gonna use it as a nose here. You can put it in the drink and shake it. I like it on the top as a nose here. So let's bring it, there's a few drops around here. Again, the Mai Tai is a super versatile recipe. You can, you can dress it up any way you like. You have the basics and then you have ways you wanna play with it. So do a lot with it, try different things. I guarantee it's a super adaptable recipe. You can use different spirits. You can use different sweeteners. You can use different sours. And it's, it's pretty much like a margarita in that way. You can kind of mix it around. So do what you want with it. This is uh, the spec that we found that works well for us. We enjoy it quite a bit. And I hope you enjoy it too at home. Quite a bit and quite often. Thank you. Uh, Mikey's gonna stick around to try everything else that we sent, but what you need to know now is that everything that came in your tasting kit or culture club box this time was intentionally meant to be paired with cocktails like this one. We have developed a new tropical cocktail series. The first one is Island Time. Uh, mm. And we had to do a really, really long night of research and development to figure out which pairings went best with everything, and these were the winners. So. Um, let's dive into all the things that are going to pair really, really well with this beauty. Um, you have seen the aromatic and the orchard, so know that those are part of it, but here are, here's everything else. Let's get started with your cheeses first. Your first soft little nugget of a child is Casatica di Bufala. This comes from Quattro Portoni in Lombardia. Uh, it's run by two brothers who historically always made cow's milk cheeses because that is what that region of Italy is known for. 
and they're also known for wash dried shoes like Telegio. They do a great Telegio. However, they bought some water buffalo from some of their friends from Southern Italy, uh, made a soft bloomy rain cheese with that water buffalo milk and Cassatica was born. And it was so good, so tangy, so complex that they sold all their cows, bought more water buffalo and have only been making water buffalo milk cheeses for the better half of the last decade. And boy am I grateful they did because it takes some of the technique that we see in Northern Italy and in France and applies it to a cheese and a milk that has never really seen that before. When we think of water buffalo milk cheese, we think of burrata and mozzarella, and we think of pizza. But this is something that is a lot more silky, a lot more complex. It's got a really, really like nice length to the finish. So I want you to hopefully make this drink, have this cheese with it. Let me find this very large knife. Mikey, you're gonna be our test subject. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the beauty of this cheese is that it is a soft bloomy rind. So you're gonna get this really nice kind of pliant, but also really delicious rind. Um, don't be afraid of all of that mold. That was all developed in our cave. Kasadika comes to us, Antonia, our news takes over, lets it revive in the cave, and then it's when it's ready to be released, it goes out to you. Senor, oh if gosh. you wouldn't mind. Mm -mm. Now, if you don't love rind texture, rind flavor, if it gives you the willies, I'm not your mom. Mm. Do whatever you want. You don't have to eat it, you can totally trim it. But I think it adds a bit of texture and a lot more depth to the flavor that gives it a bit of earthiness against that kind of yogurty kefir tang that you get in waffle book. I'm a Ryan Water, guy. Water, buffalo, milk, cheese. Yeah. Ryan guy for sure, yeah. Ryan babies, through and mm. through. Again, it's your choice. If you're gonna cook with this instead, try adding it to your next tartine. Give it a nice broil over like your favorite artisan bread and then top it with like caramelized onions, um, maybe even a little bit of those aromatic bitters in the caramelized onions and have yourself a time. Uh, it melts well, it plays well, but I love this one as a table cheese. Now your next cheese is what I've lovingly referred to as our hangover cheese. Mm -hmm. When you come to Caputo's in the morning and you see maybe a, a sleepy looking monger and they're having a cup of coffee and nibbling on a piece of cheese, it's probably this one. This is Nord Hollander or Double Aged Gouda. This cheese is aged for four years, has really, really great crystallization. Mm -hmm. You get this really lovely caramely butterscotchy um, sweet note to it that gets highlighted or even made more delicious by this occasional little crystal and crunchy, which we see in older cheeses. Those are crystallized amino acids, leucine, tyrosine crystallizations, beginning formations within the cheese. And here it adds a bit of complexity, but it adds to texture. Without those crystals, we would have something that's kind of boring on the palate. And instead, you get this. I would recommend grating this over whatever summer pasta you're going to have. I love this with ramps. If you can still find them, I love it on grilled vegetables, but take a microplane to it. See what kind of fun you can have that way. And if you're not going to do any grating, have it with a zombie. And if you have not had a zombie or you don't know how to make a zombie, this guy will teach you at the Island Time we'll class. So we'll all it. you locals can come hang with us at the next class. I need to do a little, little, uh, little, little, little testaroni. How is it? Oh yeah. Not Ooh, poison? That's great. Ooh. With that cheese, it's awesome. Really nice combo. It is probably one of my most memorable pairings from that night. I think yeah. it just played really well with like the mm. almondiness from the orgeat and the sweetness from that play really, really nicely together. Moving on to your proteins, we have some sprats from Fangs, but we also have some salami etna from our friends at Olympia Provisions. Eli Cairo is the mastermind behind Olympia Provisions, and he's from Sandy, Utah, so I call it local, and I'm running this show, so local it is. Uh, Olympia Provisions is now based in Portland. They are making really, really phenomenal salumi, but Eli's specialty is in the preservation of meat. However, he's also doing a lot of work to change the way Oregon treats the pigs that are raised for things like this. Their animal husbandry, the way that they are fed, the things that are put into their bodies is really, really important for their health and happiness and for ours. And Olympia Provisions is leading the charge in that in the United States, but primarily in Oregon right now. So thank you, Eli, we love you. This is probably the first salami that I had and fell in love with from him. This is a nod to Mount Etna in Sicily. So you see a little bit of lemon zest and some pistachio, which you really don't see in a lot of salumi other than things like mortadella. So here you're gonna get like a kind of brighter and fresher 
salami flavor than you would expect in other types. Usually we look for heat and really savory depth, and here you're gonna get something that is Sicily in a piece of salami. Can I do that? I think, yeah, I think it is time that everybody this is the, this is really the, this is the hack right here. The leans in to the old bit. meat garnish. The meat garnish is the way. It's not only for Bloody Marys anymore. Yeah, you know what? We're taking that back. It's not just theirs, it's everybody's. Look at that, oh so man. So maybe fold it up, roll it around a straw, do the whole thing. Look at that. I like the way this is going. We're making improvements to an ages old tradition. Let's get in there. Look oh at yeah, you. oh hold on now. That's beautiful. We've done That's it. That's a beautiful thing. The hard work has mm. paid off everybody and that is the key here. Now, this is something that you're gonna wanna put on your boards. However, throwing this in a frying pan and letting it get crispy and then using it as like the crunchy component to roasted vegetables, grilled vegetables, maybe even something like your first sliced tomatoes when those finally come out, keep that in mind for this. We don't cook with salami enough and I think we should. So give it a try, let me know what you think. And if you hate it, we'll argue about it. I can't <laughs> wait. Uh, fangst, sprats. Uh, fangst is not part of the Iberian Peninsula, and we spent a lot of time waxing poetic about Spain and Portugal and conservist culture. However, tin seafood extends far beyond just the Iberian Peninsula, and they are some of the best in the business doing it. So think Nordic waters, not sardines, not anchovies, but a sprat instead. Another small oily fish, but really does well in the colder waters to the north, and that's where these guys come from. Instead of being preserved in olive oil, like our Spanish and Portuguese fish usually are, this is in cold rapeseed oil. And when we say rapeseed, I think a lot of people get the squeams because we think of the terrible canola oil on our grocery store shelves in the States. However, this is, I would equate it to condiment grade olive oil. It has texture and body is really, really fun to cook with, but improves the experience of the fish. Now on top of that, it's also packed with a bit of heather and chamomile. Heather is something used in like Irish and Scottish beer making, um, but it's also used medicinally. Here it helps to amplify the chamomile flavor. And if you don't love chamomile, I'd like to know why. And mm -hmm. if you need help, I'm here for you. Chamomile for me is really comforting and really kind of soft. And here it almost makes the sprats feel a bit more smoky than they already are, but not in like a artificial smoke or liquid smoke way, one that just accentuates it in a really, really nice way. So, um, with love from Denmark. Uh, get to know them, get to love them, tell them, hey, enjoy these on toast and celebrate your existence. Uh, these and zombies are maybe my favorite thing ever. So, um, bring your favorite tin to your favorite local bar and ask them to make one for you and Try them together or make your own zombie. Now, sweet stuff. You have some fig cake and some chocolate. Fig cake is, I think, one of the simplest ways to gussy up your charcuterie board game. It is simply uh, dried pajaro figs and almonds pressed together to form a cake that is the easiest way to make all of your cheeses on a particular cheese board kind of become more cohesive. It brings things together. It celebrates kind of the marriage of flavors in a really, really fun way, but it adds texture and it adds that fruitiness that we're always looking for. And I'm tired of sad berries where they don't belong. So instead, I'm going to do this and I'd suggest you do the same thing. But if you make a little fig cake and cassatica sandwich, I don't think you're going to be very mad at yourself. So um, my old Vanna White's going to give it a try and <laughs> tell you guys if I'm <laughs> full of baloney. You are Mr. Vanna White now. How does that make you feel? I'm very sorry. I'm all right with it. You know what? I'm not sorry, actually. I take it back. I'm fine with it. I'm fine That's with great. It. You can call me whatever you want. You as long as you feed me this. Food you didn't stuff. have a choice, my guy. You can call me anything. Here oh, you go. yeah. The fig cake and Kasatika Sammy. Uh, keep it on hand. This is something that I like to have around all the time because you can throw it on like a dessert board, you can throw it on a cheese board. I really like it crumbled or like kind of chopped over oatmeal or an acai bowl. So don't be shy about just keeping this out and using it when you feel compelled to because you're probably gonna find something really, really delicious. What do you think? That's so good. <coughs> That's really, 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 really good. The texture's really nice. Uh -huh. Like you get full dried fig texture, like 
not in the Fig Newton way where it's like sad and blended till you can't really figure out what it is. You still get like the pop of all the seeds and I just think that that is such a good what compliment. Are, what are the nuts in that? Almonds. There's almond, yeah. Mm -hmm. It really yeah. tastes like a solid form of the Mai Tai. I think it's got that. There you Nutty. go. It's yum. Almond on almond action. We love it. Now your last little treat is Rococo Spice Island. Rococo is a term for the very ornate decorations of the 18 and 1900s. And the same is done in their chocolate. So this is an English brand. Spice Island refers to all the spices they put in here. Clove, cinnamon, nutmeg, all of those baking spices you would expect to see in a Falernum syrup. Mm. More to come in your next Island Hour class. Mm. But we're putting it here with some 65% dark chocolate. And it is, I think, the sweetest way to end your day or to enjoy the last sips of whatever cocktail you made to go along with all of this. That spice is gonna play really, really well with everything in here because they naturally go together. Serps were created to celebrate these same flavors. So by having it in solid form next to your drink, you get to be really playful with the things that go together already. So don't suck on this. It's not candy, it is chocolate. Give it a really, really nice chew and let it kind of melt evenly over your entire mouth and then chase it with a sip of that and tell me if you're mad then. I don't think you could be in a bad mood after stuff like that. I stand by it. Does it work? It tastes like a sunset. It's so the rest good. of my case. It's so good. We've gone to the tropics. Suddenly, we're back in Salt Lake City. Uh, it's really, really great to spend a couple minutes with you. Thank you for being part of our culture club. You're part of our food family. We love you so much. We'll see you at a class or in the comments. And if you have questions, you know where to find us. But we love you. Thank you again. Happy unboxing. Enjoy the club.